lost in the first round last year. And I know, you know, they, they, they thought they were fortified. I, I, their season has been so strange from losing Drew Holiday and then losing him to their number one rival in the conference, the Celtics, to firing Adrian Griffin, to bringing in Doc Rivers. It just, it's been such a weird thing. Oh, oh, wait, I miss bringing in Dame Lillard and sort of remaking the team around Giannis and, and that partnership. And, Tony, it hasn't worked. It just hasn't. Yeah. And, the, the, look, I think the Pacers, even if Giannis plays, are going to win that series. The way the Pacers have been going, they got just enough better on defense, and they're a great offensive team led by Halliburton. They're in a bad place, Milwaukee, and I just I want to see Giannis play. I hope he doesn't miss much time. hope he doesn't. Yeah, let me just let me make one small correction. They didn't lose Drew Holiday. They traded Drew well, Holiday. Yes, that was their own of- choice, their own choice to do that. So I look at Milwaukee now as if a hurricane has come through and the relief workers are already on the ground. You mentioned they brought in Damian Lillard, who you like a whole lot more than I like. He didn't Love want him. to be there to begin with. He wanted to go to Miami. All right, that's, that's number one. They fire their coach because it's not working. They fire their coach at 30 and 13. They bring in Doc Rivers, a huge name, who at that moment is under contract to this network calling basketball games on television. It's a disaster. They're 17 and 19 since he started coaching three and seven in their last 10. And now they have lost their best and most important player, a player who has won a championship. MVP. It's like they're being yeah. washed out to sea, Mike. Washed out to sea. Really, that's how I feel. I know, Tony. It just is a weird way to start the playoffs to them. They couldn't start in a, in a worse position than not having Giannis no. on the floor. So, I mean, we'll see. No. But again, no. the Pacers have a little bit of momentum and an exciting young team to watch. We'll see what's up. We move now to last night's WNBA draft and the expected selection overall number one of Caitlin Clark by the Indiana Fever. Clark brings tremendous attention and potential television ratings from college to the pros. But Clark wasn't the only person drafted, though she dominated the coverage. Well, but I'm guessing there's another team you think drafted great. Two more, Tony, and I'm going to tell you who they are. The L.A. Sparks, because they got Cameron Brink who's a, just a tremendous defensive presence, who's improving offensively, the Stanford All-American, uh, who is now going to go to L.A., stay in state, and Rakia Jackson, the Tennessee All-American, who's just a great all-around player. Great. And some make the case that Rakia Jackson was the best player in the draft. And if you've watched enough of it, no, she didn't shoot it maybe like Caitlin Clark, but she does a lot of other things. And then the Chicago Sky, a couple of years removed from a championship, Drafting Cardosa out of the off the championship South Carolina team and Angel Reese. Angel Reese, they moved up. They got Angel Reese. They got two people who are going to prevent opponents from ever grabbing a rebound or getting off an uncontested shot in the paint. And then Brenna Maxwell, a shooter from Gonzaga. Three starters, it would seem to me, in that one draft in those in that draft last night, Tony. So yeah, I get it. Indiana should be thrilled. But so should people follow in the sparks and the sky. Yeah, and I knew you would say that, and, and you're 100% right in what you say, but I'm going to go back to Caitlin Clark, who I believe walks into the WNBA as the biggest star that they have. And the WNBA should be very happy that their league is starting in about an hour so they can capitalize on the momentum yes. that Caitlin Clark brings to the league. Agree. I read today that, that a tremendous chunk of the Indiana games are going to be on national TV. National yeah. television. 36 out of 40 in some form on national television. And 10 of them on ABC, ESPN, or CBS. And I'm going to wager that that's 10 more than the Indiana Fever had on television this year when they were a losing <laughs> oh, they were team. Terrible. And this, yeah. this is what Caitlin Clark brings. She brings eyes on. We don't know how great she's going to be. We don't know. It's an adjustment. She's playing with better players. That's the experiment we're all going to watch. But she brings eyes on. That's a big deal. It is a big deal, Tony. Big night for the WNBA, period. Big stretch run going with momentum into the season. I agree with you on that. The timing of it's great. I can't wait. I'm I'm, I'm I'm going to some Chicago Sky games again. Went when Candace Parker was playing, certainly. And now to the NHL where Connor McDavid last night became just the fourth player in NHL history to amass 100 assists in a single season. McDavid joins Bobby Orr and Mario Lemieux, who each did it once, and the great one, Mr. Wayne Gretzky, who did it, listen up, 
11 times. Thank you, Wilt. Tony Austin Matthews goes for his 70th goal tonight in Florida. Is 100 assists in a season, though, more impressive than 70 goals in a season? So this is a value judgment. I would say that to the general public, goals are more important, that the general public mm -hmm. fastens on to goals in hockey the way they fasten on to home runs in baseball. Yep. And so assists are more like RBI. They're very important in the box score, and they win games, but they're not as glamorous. The case I can make for 100 assists is on the, the people you have just mentioned. The only other people, people. who have done it yes. are Gretzky, yes. Lemieux, and Orr. That's it. That's the list. And, Mike, they are yeah. arguably the three greatest players who ever played, who ever yeah. played hockey. You can make that case. In terms of, you know, getting to 100, uh, getting to 70 goals, Matthews is chasing eight different people. Bernie Nichols is one of them. Timu Solani is one of them. Alexander McGillney is one of them. They're great players, but they're not top three. They're not top five. They're not top eight. They're, they're not. Now, the top three guys are in there, too. You know, yeah. Orr and Gretzky, Gretzky and Lemieux. Lemieux but Hall, Esposito, McGillney, Solani, Curry. Yeah. They're Hall of Famers. They're, <laughs> no, or, or, okay, in my year, Orr never had 70 goals. Yeah. yeah. So here, here's what I'm saying. I'm part of the general unwashed public, and I go for the goals. I'm not insulting 100 assists. I think it's great, but I go for the goals. I'm going for the assists because of the people. I, it's the people. If you give me a list in, the, in, in baseball and you say it's Ruth and Mays and Aaron, I'm going to say, okay, yeah. then I'm going with that. Yeah. And that's the equivalent yeah. of this when you have or and it'll make Bob Ryan very happy at home. They were mentioning or with Gretzky. Gretzky or Lemieux, what else you need? I'm going with that. Going with okay. them. Okay, let's take a break. Coming up, will the Warriors avoid elimination tonight? We're going to ask Tim Legler. We're also going to ask him why the Lakers have had such success against the Pelicans. It is a ball night. One of the great ball nights yeah. in years. For first for playing. Yeah. We're not even at the main yeah, event was... yet. I was going to go to dinner and then maybe a concert. You great friend of long standing, long before ESPN. ESPN NBA analyst Tim Legler. Tim, let's start with Legs. this. Tonight's elimination game is the play-in game between the Warriors and the Kings. Wilbon and I honestly would both like to see the Warriors in the main draw. What do you think the chances are of that? Yeah, look, I'm with you guys as far as this goes. I, I try not to be a fan. But how can you not with Steph Curry? Give me more Curry. Right? That's the way I always look at every postseason. So you look at this game, and here's how I think it's going to go. The Kings are shorthanded. That's a problem for them. They've got two very important players that are out, Malik Monk, Kevin Herter. Like, that's a lot of offense. That's also extra bodies at the guard spot that you throw on a guy like Curry. So the fact that they're shorthanded combined with – the way Golden State played Sabonis last year in the playoffs. They won that series. Now, it took 50 points out of Steph Curry in a game seven. So Sacramento certainly gave them all they could handle. But ultimately, they held Sabonis, I think, four games in that series below his normal scoring average because they bottled him up. Draymond played him great. Looney played him great. They made him play in spaces he wasn't super comfortable with. I can see that game plan taking shape against Sabonis again. And then the fact that the Kings are shorthanded combined with Curry – being the one guy of everybody involved in this game that you have the most faith in having a huge moment when it has to be had, I like the Golden State Warriors to win this game on the road and, and grab, and grab that, another opportunity to get themselves into the playoffs. Well, Legs, all the action, of course, as you know, is out here in the West. And the 7-8 game, Lakers-Pelicans, even though, well, <laughs> slightly east in New Orleans. But that game has such intrigue. The Lakers drubbed the Pelicans in New Orleans by 16 the other day, uh, beat them 3-1 in the season series. Tim, other than the obvious advantage of size, the Lakers have a lot of it, and New Orleans not so much, what, what gives the Lakers an advantage? And I'm presuming you think they have an advantage in this single game tonight. They do have the advantage. And I'm, look, you said they won the season series three out of four, but the last two are the two I'm really focused on and how they attacked them. The discipline they showed in not taking – what is their weakness, which is the early three-point shot? The Lakers only took an average of 30, 30 threes in those two games, 29 and 31. Really low numbers, even by NBA standards. That, those are low numbers for NBA teams to take. The reason was because they got 68 points in the paint in both games. 
To put that in perspective, the Lakers are second in the league, I believe, in scoring in that manner. But that was 12 points a game higher in each of those games than their season average. The discipline that they had to attack a smaller team, a weaker team, and to use their size advantage and skill advantage from their two best players to really dominate them in a certain way physically, to me, was the difference between the two teams. And then the last component always for the Lakers, who is going to give you the timely three-point shooting? They take the second fewest in the league. It's just not part of their repertoire. But you need some in a league like this. In those two games, D'Angelo Russell and Austin Reeves combined to go 17 for 34 from the three. So it's going to take that. There's going to be threes to be had for those two guys. Rui Hachimura's going to get some. You've got to make your share. You can't be a minus 18 or minus 24 or minus 30 from the three-point line despite your interior dominance. So it takes a little bit of both, and they did both of that in those two games, and that's why I think the Lakers will win this game, and their reward will be the Denver Nuggets. <laughs> Some reward. Uh, let's look at tomorrow night for a second, uh, game one of our doubleheader. and it, it, it's, it's got so much intrigue and layers to it. Miami at Philly. Jimmy Butler and Joel Embiid legs. Do they have, are, are they in the kind of form that is going to let either one of these guys have a clear advantage tomorrow night and maybe beyond? Are either one of those guys are both playing up to that level in your eyes? Joel Embiid certainly is. And I know that everybody sort of held their collective breath because he came back, had a great run, looked dominant. They won a bunch of games. And then in that game 81, he goes out of the game limping. Same knee. Everybody's like, oh, here we go. We're going to be dealing with this the rest of the way. Came back into the game and finished the game and finished it strong. So I don't know what that was. Whatever it is, they say he's healthy. He had extended rest going into this because he didn't play in the last game of the season. They didn't need him that night against Brooklyn. He looks as dominant as he's ever been. Jimmy Butler's had a very strange year, even by his standards. We know that he's more about the playoffs and all that. He has been very quiet as an offensive player over the last month. The question is, does he have that gear in this setting, in Philadelphia? Do you have that gear to go in there and dial it up and have a 30-point night? Because I think that's what it's going to take against Philly. I have no doubt Embiid is going to have a monster game because he's that fresh, he's energized, his legs feel great because of all the time off that he had. But I'm going to give you one more name that I think will be the difference in the game. Tyrese Maxey is the difference in this game. Uh, he uplifts Embiid. He's the best co-star that he has had in terms of showing up when the lights are bright. You're going to see Tyrese Maxey flourish. I think not only in this game, I think the Philadelphia 76ers represent the biggest threat to the Boston Celtics in the Eastern Conference. Here, here. All right, we'll get you out of here on this, and I'm going to ask you, you've got to give a very quick answer, because the game is not really all that much. Atlanta Hawks <laughs> and Will Bond Chicago Bulls, not the sexiest yeah. game of all time. How much hope, honestly, should Wilbon have in five seconds or less? Listen, if any game deserves a quick answer, it's that game. I can tell you that much. And I, and I, and I, will, say, I will say, listen, it, I, if you think I'm going to predict the winner of the Hawks-Bulls play-in game, I'd be in Vegas making a lot of money if I knew the outcome of that one. It's a 50-50 call, Mike. I'll give the Bulls, I'll I'll give the Bulls a nod. You got it. You got it. That's fair. Thank you, Tim, as always. That's great, awesome. Great pleasure for us. Thank, Thank you, you, Tim. Thank you. Let's take one last break. Still to come, Blake Griffin makes a decision about his future. And our thoughts on the life and times of Whitey Herzog. Blake Griffin is a, a, a decision on his future. Happy time, people. Happy 69th birthday, Bruce Boshi. Boshi took three years off after leading the San Francisco Giants following the 2019 season. Boshi had won three World Series there. He came back last season with the Texas Rangers, promptly won a fourth World Series. So he's headed to Cooperstown, despite a career record of 2,102 and 2,109. Boshi is now the second oldest manager in the majors, behind Ron Washington of the Angels. He's in his 27th year of managing in the bigs, 12 with the Padres, 13 with the Giants, now his second with the Rangers. His playoff record, 57 and 37. And beyond managing, Boshi is known for his giant eight and a quarter hat size. Ah, Tony, you could be a terrific manager and still get so much less credit than, say, coaches in the NFL or coaches in the NBA. 
I don't know how it stacks up to the NHL, but I think baseball managers now, after being iconic figures all of our lives, early lives, they're now, they seem sort of incidental, and I don't buy that. Nor do I. Happy anniversary, yeah, Russell good. Wilson. On this day five years ago, the Super Bowl winning quarterback signed a four-year, $140 million extension to stay with the Seahawks through the 2023 season, making Wilson the NFL's most highly paid player. Within a few years, things had soured, and Wilson was traded to the Broncos. That was a disaster. Wilson got huge money, but took the brunt of criticism for the Broncos losing, and was benched, then released. Wilson is now looking forward to a renewal in Pittsburgh under Mike Tomlin, who said Wilson is in the pole position to start, but he will get competition from Justin Fields, as the Steelers have utterly cleaned out their quarterback room. Yeah, Russell Wilson took a lot of grief last year from a head coach who likes to point the finger at other people when it suits him. He didn't play badly. He wasn't great, but he wasn't bad. A lot of quarterbacks in the league who were worse than Russell Wilson last year. I hope Mike Tomlin gets more out of him, gets what's out of him that's left in there that didn't happen in Denver. A melancholy trails to Whitey Herzog. The Hall of Fame manager died overnight at 92. Whitey, whose given name was Doral Norman Elbert Herzog, was known for an innovative and strategic style of managing that came to be known as Whitey Ball. When Herzog managed the Kansas City Royals, he emphasized stolen bases. When he managed the St. Louis Cardinals, he emphasized speed over power. His Cardinals won the 1982 World Series when they hit only 67 home runs all season. Herzog played in the majors for the Washington Senators, Kansas City A's, Baltimore and Detroit, from 1956 to 1963, batting 257, and later remarked, quote, baseball has been good to me since I quit trying to play it, unquote. It's such a great line, Tony, and it's just cool to me as a kid who grew up in the Midwest that Whitey Herzog did his best work, and a lot of it, in Kansas City and St. Louis, even though one of those franchises I was born to hate. He did his work right there in the Midwest. He didn't say, oh, you got to get me out to a glamorous spot. Did his work there. Good for him. He will be missed. What a career. What a life and what a career. Additionally, we want to note the passing of Carl Erskine, the last surviving member of the Boys of Summer Brooklyn Dodgers, who died this morning at 97. Erskine pitched two no-hitters, once struck out 14 in a World Series game in 1953, <laughs> and Erskine pitched in five different World Series. Tony, he's not the first name that comes to mind with that group, the Boys of Summer, but you just listed some things that make you go wow with him. And also off yeah. the field, in terms of just his humanity, seemed to be a, 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 a quite a figure. Absolutely. Let's go to the big finish if we could. Blake Griffin retired. Let's do it. How will you remember his career? Tony jumping over a car to a dunk. I mean, you know, he's an all-star many times yeah. as rookie of the year. But the slam dunk championship and jumping over a Kia, Kia owes him, don't they? The Rangers clinched the President's Trophy with the most points in the league. Your thoughts? Last team to win that had the President's Trophy was your Blackhawks in 2013. Bring Messier back, win the whole thing. The Nets will reportedly hire Jordy Fernandez as their next head coach. Makes sense? You know, he was a Kings assistant under Mike Brown. Um, it, it seems like I mean, people, a lot of people think he's going to be able to do a good job as a head coach. Rick Pitino and St. John's agreed to a home and home with Mark Pope and Kentucky. You like that? No, I love it. Pitino going back to Kentucky to play against one of his old players. You think people will tune into that? Last yeah. one, Cubs rookie Michael Bush is home in five straight. Six tonight? I'd like that here in Arizona. Tony, that division, the NL Central, best division in baseball. We are out of time. We will try and do better the next time. I'm Tony Kornheiser. I'm Mike Wilbon. Same time tomorrow, Knuckleheads. You can get the podcast on the ESPN app or Apple Podcasts. Tony, Blake Griffin is a smart, funny guy. Don't tell me he wouldn't be good on TV. I know he will be. Yeah.